Dear God, we are appreciative of what you do for us, not just as Christians, but as basic human beings. You've given us the blessing of sight, the blessing of hearing, the blessing of smell and taste, which we will explore later today at Potluck. Right now, we want to explore the basic, a basic sense, a sense of danger. We pray that you will guide us and teach us to pay attention to this sense, this spiritual sense of identifying danger, of identifying falsehood when it comes our way. So Lord, we pray for your spirit to guide us in the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How, or rather can you, do you know how to identify a false teacher? Think about that. Are you able, do you know how, can you explain to someone in your family how to identify a false teacher? This marks part one of my messages on spiritual defenses. For those of you who are interested in learning more about spiritual warfare, uh, Tamara and myself and several others, I think that Esther was there and Robin was there just this last week. We've been going through a Bible study on spiritual warfare. We highly encourage you to be there if you're able. It's every Tuesday. What day? Tuesday at 4 o'clock p.m. But if you show up at a.m., let me know. Um, I'd be very interested to know if anybody else is here. So this is part one of our messages on spiritual defenses. The Bible warns that many false prophets will assault the people of God. And because I care for you, because I care for you as, as a church here at, at uh, Fruita Seventh-day Adventist Church, I want to make sure that you are prepared, that you have, you have the word of God to show you. How can I tell if I'm listening to a false teacher. Let's start off with perhaps the biblical term. The biblical term for a false teacher is not false teacher at all. It uses a different word. It says a false prophet. And perhaps the best place that we have as a warning for false prophets is from Matthew 7, verses 15 through 16. Matthew 7, 15 through 16 say, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? To the teaching and to the testimony, which we're going to read next. Can we see an apple tree produce grapes? If you have, please let me know. I would love to come take pictures because that's, that's unheard of. A plant produces the fruit that it's designed to produce. We believe that God made every plant and every tree according to its kind. And while you can, through horticulture, take, take a piece of, of one tree and then graft it onto another, and you can, you can play with that by design, naturally speaking, if you just leave an, a tree in the wild and you come upon it and it's a crab apple tree, you're not going to expect to find something else. Jesus says that likewise, a teacher, this is, this is the most famous passage in all of scripture when it comes to false prophets. A false prophet, you will know, you will recognize them because their fruits will be different than what they're preaching. Did you hear that? You, the, if you hear nothing else, this is it. You will know a false prophet, a dead giveaway. A dead giveaway is that the fruit of their life is different than what they're preaching. Is this the only way that you can tell that someone is a false prophet? Ah, the Bible gives us more. In fact, Jesus tells us that it's not just about the fruits. It's also about the intention. He says they may come seeming like they are sheep. They are clothed that way. They look soft and fuzzy and they, you feel good when you listen to them. But on the inside of who they are, they are something entirely different. The reason why the fruits matter is because the fruits are indicative of what? Of, of what's inside. The fruits of the Spirit don't just happen because I want them. They happen because of the indwelling of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Okay, so if you want to have the fruits of the Spirit, what do you need to have? The Spirit. If, if you are having a hard time producing the fruits of the Spirit, the first place you should check is with yourself. Do I have the Spirit? If someone says they have the fruit, if, the, if someone says they have the Spirit, I preach with the Spirit, and you see no fruits, there's a, there's a very high likelihood that that person is a what? That's a false prophet, a false teacher, as we're going to call them today. So there are diff several times, several different types of false preachers. Here are the types that we are going to be talking about today. There are greedy preachers. There are clout-chasing personalities. There are those who are blind, leading the blind. 
There are the hateful and the turned around. And at the very end, we're going to talk about the worst and most insidious type of false teacher. Let's look at these together. We're going to return to the, to the topic of false prophets. There's one other test that we can tell. It, it, these, are, these are preliminaries. These are things you don't even have to think hard about. The first one is, you shall know them by their fruits. The second one is Isaiah 8.20. Isaiah 8, 20, which says to the law and to the testimony, if they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn in them. The Hebrew there says, because it hasn't even dawned on them yet. The light of, of the sun's rays have not even peaked over the horizon in their life. They are in total and complete darkness. A small clarification there. If I say something and I haven't referenced the Bible yet, does that make me a false teacher? Hmm. Not automatically, right? Because we speak all the time. But if someone is teaching you and their entire motivation or their entire reasoning for why they think something is true is not found in the Bible, that's not, that's not good teaching there. That's not from the Bible. It's in the words. If you are able to trace what someone is saying back to the Bible, then listen away. Keep on listening. But if you aren't able to trace back, and oftentimes these people, the difficulty is that sometimes some of our preachers have gotten very lax and we're not able to point back to the Bible. Even though we know, we're sure it's probably in there. This is why it's really important that we pick preachers who are responsible with the word, who are responsible with you, the audience, the people of God, and that we say, thus saith the Lord right here. Thus saith the Lord, I'm telling you this morning in Isaiah 8.20, if they don't speak according to the law and to the testimony... To the law and to the prophets, if they won't reference that, high likelihood that's a false teacher. In fact, the Bible goes as far as to say, they don't even have the light in them. There are some people who God delivers light through general revelation, something we'll talk about more another time. Through general revelation, even though they may not be Christians, even though they may not have ever read the Bible, the Spirit has impacted in their life Bible truths. Paul talks about this, how people throughout all of human history have had an opportunity to know God because God has revealed through them, through nature, through life, the principles that we have been so blessed to have in a book, in the Bible, for you and me. So if you hear someone speaking, you say, I recognize that from the Bible. You can listen to that. You can trace that back to the law and to the testimony. 1 John 4.1, 1 John 4.1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. First John tells us <clears throat> false teaching is going to be prevalent. If you are a Christian person, if you are in seeking, if you are seeking after truth, expect it. Expect that you will run into false teachers. Don't wonder if you will. Don't hope that your pastor will never give you false teaching. Expect it to happen. Come to the Bible with it as being your guide and come to preachers with a skepticism that can only be quenched by seeing it in the Bible. Let me say that again. Don't come, don't come to your preachers with an open mind. Come to your preachers with a skepticism that can only be cured by them going to scripture. That is how you should cure skepticism is by coming back to God's word. So these various different types of preachers, the greedy preacher, the greedy teacher, the teacher who, is, who cares about money, that is the first type of preacher you should avoid. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. This verse that I read to you early, earlier talks specifically about what? Hmm, that's a good question. What, what is it talking about here? Sheep? In, in what relationship does a sheep and a wolf have? Who eats who? <laughs> uh, let me tell you a real experience that happened to me. I mistakenly agreed to work with a pastor from a different denomination. This is real. This actually happened. And Pastor Lynch, if you're listening, I, I, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry that I, that I joined up with this person. But what he was doing was wrong. Like, dead wrong. Let me, let me narrate for you what it's like in some of these places where a pastor will come down into the audience because it's his birthday and ask people to give him money in his hand. Cash. He didn't put that cash into a plate. He put it into his pocket. We reported that man to the IRS. 
You may not believe it, but a great majority of preachers that you're going to find on TV, online, on TikTok, on Instagram, or on YouTube are financially motivated. Let me make sure that I make that really clear. The majority of preachers that you will find are likely financially motivated in their preaching. I want you to think, is that how the preachers in the Bible were motivated? When we listen to someone, look at those fruits. Does this person drive a fancy, brand new, expensive car? Does this person's preaching revolve around asking people to plant that seed? Beware of the greedy preacher. Some people get into preaching and teaching because they see it as an easy avenue to money. This is true. Christians are some of the most gullible people that I know. Why? Because believers are often coming out of a life of abuse. Because we're coming out of a life of being gaslit, of fearfulness, and above all, vulnerability. Christian people become Christians because they see hope at the end, a light at the end of the tunnel. Hope in a desperate life. And greedy preachers will take advantage of that vulnerability. Exploit it. Promise you that God will see you through. Will promise the wealth that God has promised to Abraham that you can have it too. As long as you just are willing to just give a little bit more. Beware of those preachers. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but the inside, this is Matthew 23, 25, if you want to write that down. Matthew 23, 25 says that you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside, where the food actually goes, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. 2 Peter 2.3 says, this is 2 Peter 2.3. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Rest assured, friend, while Christians, good, well-meaning Christians may exist listening to these false teachers, God is also listening, and their destruction is imminent. This is the most common type of false preacher that most people identify. I think everyone here in this audience uh, and anybody listening will say, oh, definitely, pastors should not live an ostentatious life. They should not be full of, of greed and money and wealth, stealing from the, from the congregation and demanding that they tithe. And if they can't tithe, then, well, they better give an offering because if they don't give an offering, then God doesn't like a cheer, so unless you're a cheerful giver. And oh, heaven forbid that you say, make up any excuse for why you can't. I think we all agree. Definitely not the kind of preacher I want to listen to. Definitely not the personality on, on the TV or on the internet that I want to, to listen and pay attention to because they're motivated by greed and finance. We all agree with that. But as we go through each of these lists, it's going to get a little bit more difficult for you to say, hmm, I never thought about that one. Clout chasers. What is clout? Recently, a friend of mine <laughs> will share with me videos, uh, just short form videos of, of people doing the most ridiculous things. And he sends them because he's angry and he wants somebody to be angry with him. And I oblige. So people will do all sorts of things on the internet for a little bit of internet fame, for a few internet, made up internet points. The dopamine rush that you get from just seeing everybody suddenly like your post is a, is a dopamine hit that you're probably not going to get with many other substances unless you start paying good money or start abusing the medical system. It, and so for this reason, I'm, I'm very sympathetic toward people on the internet who find themselves trapped in this cycle of trying to make the next best thing, the next most entertaining piece of media so that people can consume and like and share with their friends. But clout chasing, chasing after the pedigree of being recognized, chasing after fame, chasing after recognition is not something the Bible has ever, has ever, made the priority of a preacher. Someone teaching the Bible should not be chasing clout. That's right. A preacher shouldn't be trying to be famous. That shouldn't be the purpose. You know what happens to a preacher or a teacher who is after fame? Same thing that has happened to newspapers as of recently. Same thing that has happened to a lot of news articles that you'll find online with misleading titles, with misleading headings that will say something that will catch your eye. 
If you spent any amount of time on, on platforms like TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or anything that promotes short form videos, uh, short form videos, you'll notice that there's an abundance of Christian personalities. Oftentimes these aren't even pastors. These are just people who are, who are trying to share some really exciting biblical perspective. I remember the first one that I saw that really caught my attention. And I, it took me a long time to try and work through everything they were saying in the short 60 seconds that they said it. They had pointed out that in scripture, the word pedophile never, appeal, never appears. Have you ever noticed that? You don't find pedophilia in the Bible. Is that, is that odd to you? I, that's odd to me. I have children. Why wouldn't God care about something like that? God says he hates the effeminate, says he hates thieves. It says he hates those who oppress the poor. But it says nothing about pedophilia. Well, what this person on the internet said was, well, actually, those passages that talk about homosexuals are actually a mistranslation that the Catholic Church mistranslated away from a child abuser and into homosexuality. And that just, pff, I was like, what? I was floored. I couldn't believe it. And I really couldn't. So I went and I looked it up. And here's the difficult part. It doesn't matter if he was right or wrong. Because millions of people saw that. Millions of people's attention was caught in that instant and shared it. And now this person has an entire base of people who are listening, who is chasing really after the next novel thing. Pastors fall into this trap most often out of all of these. Most of modern day preaching, both in Adventism and in Christianity as a whole, is based on the idea of finding something novel. Most of exegesis is actually based on that practice. The practice of trying to find something new that your audience probably hasn't heard before and then bringing it to light. That's clout chasing. That's trying to appeal to a sense of, ah, look at this shiny new thing. Beware of teachers like that. Beware of preachers who are constantly bringing up things you've never heard before. Things that, that you're like, I didn't see that in the Bible before. And you go back and you try and find it yourself by yourself without the information that they've given you. And try and see if you can find that. Can I really find that in the Bible? Or do I need to have that specific spin that that preacher gave it? That's probably a false teacher. That's sad because so much of what you're going to find online is going to fall into this category. The category of people who are just chasing after developing a big fan base, a big audience, a big recognition. Beware. Our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. This is what, jo this is what Paul told the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 6. You can write this down for why you should avoid cloud, clout or fame-chasing personalities. People who say sensational things to try and get your attention. Beware of these people. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 6 says, Our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God and to be entrusted with the gospel, that's so then we speak. Not so that we can please man, not so that people will like what we say, not so that it will pique your interest, but so that we can please God. The purpose of exegesis, the purpose of Bible preaching, the purpose of teaching people about Jesus isn't so that they might be interested. The Holy Spirit does that part. It is so that they will be informed. It is so that God will be pleased with the service that I have done, that you have done in teaching someone. This is what the Bible plainly says. Beware of these personalities. So we speak not to please man, but to please who? God, the one who tests the intentions of the heart. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, and God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, we could have used our status to say, well, we're apostles of Christ, you recognize us, listen to what we have to say. But that's not the way of a true teacher. The true teacher will always and every single time point back to scripture. Friend, if, if you go to a sermon, and I recently listened to various on some research that I'm doing for some upcoming sermons, where people just stand up and they will just talk and talk and keep talking and get amens from the congregation. And I'm left with my little notebook and I think, boy, you know, I haven't written down a single Bible verse. You know, if, if a non-believer talks truth without referencing the Bible, that's one thing. 
But when a pastor, a well-recognized figure, someone who has been deeply involved with media ministries like 3ABN stand up and start saying things and people, oh, you may agree. They may say things you agree. But if they're not pointing back to the Bible over and over again, that's a false teacher. Friend, be very careful. The world is full of false prophets. It is full of deception. Most of it, haphazard deception that wasn't even intended for you to be deceived. It is simply someone chasing clout, using their own fame to build a platform. The blind leading the blind, another type of teacher you should be aware of. This is important, friend. This is important because we live in deceiving times. We live in times where your faith will be challenged, where my faith will be tested, where what you believe will be shaped and reshaped by the culture around you unless you anchor yourself in the word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Unless you anchor your faith in the word of God, you will be changed by the society. Do you understand? Amen. Amen. That is why we put our faith and our trust in the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Who built his house on the sand? The one who listened to his words and didn't listen. Who built his house on the rock? The one who not just heard the words of Christ, but did them. How can you do the words of Christ if you don't read them? How can your teacher teach you how to do the things that Christ has taught us if he doesn't show them to you? Approach every preacher with skepticism. Approach me with skepticism. Refer back to the Bible. Is the Bible telling me this? That is what I will base my faith on. Therefore, we must be very careful of this next type of false teacher. The blind leading the blind. <clears throat> I'm going to say the name of some platforms, not because those platforms are evil, though maybe they are, but because I need you to be aware that I, I know these platforms. I'm on some of them. Maybe you are. Maybe you have a little brother or a little sister or a cousin or a nephew who uses these. And while they can be great educational tools, maybe a, an innocent pastime, they also propagate just like, any sort of, just like any sort of stream, if you pour something toxic upstream, downstream, people are going to get that. The same thing is happening here. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok accounts, they will make sensational claims with little or no training or credibility. Things, questions that you can ask right away. Who is this person? You hear something. Before, before you switch off your brain and you, you say, ooh, shiny, I've never heard that about this Bible passage. Think. I don't care if you agree. Think. Who is this person? Have I seen this person before? Why should I trust them? What training do they have? What sources are they referencing? Recently, I, I saw a video <laughs> with someone who said, who was at the store and they were pointing out uh, a box of Colgate and they, not sponsored by the way, and they were saying, you know, toothpaste is a sham. You don't need to use toothpaste. Just rinse your, moder your, your mouth with some water and just, and you know, don't even need to brush your teeth. And I thought, I I'm sorry, who is this? Why should I be listening to you? This guy probably doesn't brush his teeth. Am I really going to listen to this guy? Who is he a doctor? What, can, he, can he link me to some, some studies that he's done or studies that he's read on? Can I access those studies? Because if I list you a study that you can never read, is that study really useful? No. A lot of studies today are paywalled. You, you'll have to pay to get access to them. In my opinion, that's, that's pretty useless. If, if someone says, I've done my own research, I'm really impressed. Because doing your own research requires money nowadays. Not just a quick Google search. What are the sources really? Where are these people getting this from? What else are they teaching? I'll follow that account and I'll, I'll look. I'm like, oh, they're also saying this. Well, I, I know that's not from the Bible. Oh, they're saying that Sunday is the day of worship, a day of rest. Well, uh, I'll put a minus one there for credibility because this person seems to not understand the Bible. Do Sunday keepers, can they have Bible truth? Amen. Okay. What we're talking about here is false teachers, people who are intentionally misrepresenting what God says, sometimes not even trying very hard. Ask yourself these questions, because these might just be blind people leading other blind people. If all they teach is novelties you've never heard of, chances are this person is making stuff up. I am sorry, but that is most likely the truth. Maybe not on purpose, but because they have little or incomplete understandings of the scriptures. Be very conscious, be very skeptical of anything you read online. How can I trust that this is even remotely true, especially when it comes to the Bible? Luke 6.39 says, he also told them a parable. Can the blind man lead a blind man, Jesus asks. This is Luke 6.39. Will they not both fall into a pit? I grew up here in Colorado. For those of you who don't recognize me or don't know, I grew up just down that way. Oh, goodness, let me think. Just down that way a ways on the other, on the other corner of, uh, of the Grand Mesa. 
near the Uncarpaglia Plateau in Olathe, Colorado. Beautiful country. I wish I could live there my whole life. But I also wish I didn't have to live where I'm currently living. I can't wait to move to our new home. It's a beautiful place. Lots of farming happens. My father is a farmer. And something that I always enjoyed doing, it was always a little scary, but it, it got my adrenaline going, was getting to move cows from one field to another field there. And, and it wasn't uncommon, and some of you are very familiar with this lifestyle, that if you needed to go anywhere, you needed to make sure that you were yielding to the cows. Because that traffic was more important than you. They were probably worth more than your entire car. So we're moving cows. And I'll never forget this one instance where as I'm making sure that we're all staying, we start coming up against a big ditch, big enough to probably be a small river, at least by Colorado standards. And I watch as one cow, an older cow, starts going straight for that ditch. And I started yelling after it and I started walking and I saw a devastating thing. Other younger cows were following this older cow and they were all headed straight for the ditch. And here's the thing about cows. Cows are social creatures, they will follow. And as this cow got away from the herd, it went and it tumbled down into this frozen ditch. Big, uh, we'll go ahead and say it was a small river. This frozen river. And it landed and it broke through the ice. And oh boy, it was awful. The difficult part was that we got there just in time to stop these other cows from following suit. Would you like to know what was wrong with this cow that fell in? That's right, it was blind. This cow was blind. It had developed uh, something on its eyes. It wasn't able to see clearly, they were clouded over. This blind cow had inadvertently led other little cows to follow suit. Be very careful, friend, of blind leading the blind. They may seem older, wiser, they may seem like bright lights that once shone in the Adventist church. Are they pointing back to the Bible? Are they pointing to Christ? Because sometimes we'll say things we don't know what we're talking about. We'll say things that we're opinionated about and you may agree with them. But we don't determine truth on whether or not I, whether or not I agree. We determine it on whether it's in the word of God. Amen. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit. When we finally took this cow out, <laughs> I could not explain to myself, why does it want to go back into the ditch? And so they tied it on a big piece of machinery. I forget what it was. It was probably a disking machine, an attachment to a tractor. And the entire time, from the moment that we left all the way four or five miles down, and then finally came back, that cow was still there, pulled taut, taut against this big machine, pulling on it, stubborn. Because when you're blind, when you're blind, friend, and you're teaching people wrong hoods, pride takes over. And it's not about what the Bible says anymore. It's about my own pride. It's about my own way, stuck, digging my heels into the dirt, pulling against the immovable force. That is the word of God. Be very careful of the blind leading the blind. Even if they once were very respectable gentlemen and women in our church. Let them alone, says Jesus in Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Referenced again there in Matthew. Second Peter 2.12, you can write this down. Second Peter 2.12 to look up later. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Friend, I appreciate that you're patient with me. These are important matters because we're living in difficult times, a time when there's a scarcity in the world, not for bread, not for water, but for the word of God. And I am aware of the struggle that it is to be a Christian nowadays, especially an Adventist, a part of the remnant group. As we hear more and more division within our church over issues on women, over issues on gays, over issues on money now, Friend, beware of false teachers. Beware, friend. Don't be a false teacher. Be aware of each of these. Be aware of the clout chaser. Be aware of the greedy teacher. Be aware of the blind leading the blind. And I need you to be aware of my least favorite kind of false teacher. The hateful and the turned around. I'm going to give you a moment to stop and think about that. 
Beware of the false teacher who is hateful and turned around. Isaiah 5.20 says this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and who put light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Friend, be very careful of a preacher who tells you that it's loving to hate. Who tells you that it's hateful to love. Friend, be very careful when a preacher tells you that the best, most loving thing is to be impatient with someone. That the kind thing to do is actually to be rude. That what they really need is a good elbow. A good, <clears throat> some tough love. Those who call good, evil. Those who call love, hate. And hate, love. This type of preacher is turned around. They will deliberately take something the Bible has very clearly told you and then will put a spin on it. Ah, oh, well, well, actually, you see, um, it, Jesus isn't actually telling us to get rid of our belongings and give them to the poor. You see, actually, what he's saying is it's completely the opposite. Beware of that teacher. Beware of anybody who tells you that what the Bible says is actually the complete opposite of what the Bible says. Because that person is turned around and often that person is using the Bible to fuel more hate. There are teachers who often are hateful towards some group or something. They will often make it their brand to tell it like it is. You all know people like this. When what they're really doing is just using inflammatory language for the sake of seeming tough or honest. There was never a time where Jesus minced words. There was also never a time when Jesus pretended that what he was doing was one thing when it was really something else. Often these teachers will say contradicting things or twist the words of scripture to mean literally the opposite. For example, a turned around preacher may say that we should hate someone in sin because that is the loving thing to do. They may say that we should be hard and critical of certain class or certain classes of people because they are an abomination and will claim that this is how God wants us to treat the gay or the pedophile or the convict or the Catholic. Avoid these hateful preachers. Avoid these false teachers because they teach that hate is love. That criticism is encouraging. That the tear down is to build up. They teach that condemnation is mercy, that judgment is good news. Think twice before accepting a teacher that uses intentionally contradicting language. I'm going to tell you right now. You may have heard that judgment is good news. This is the same false teaching. Judgment is judgment. Good news is good news. Judgment is that each and every one of us is lost. That is not good news. Judgment is that Christ is coming and he will repay our, our works with what they're worth. And every single one of our works, every single one of our works, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. Amen? Amen. Because the good news, ah, see, the good news is different. The good news is that Jesus Christ has paid his blood so that my works don't count against me. Only the precious blood of Jesus and his life is saving to me. Amen. They are not the same thing. Never make that mistake. Do not listen to a teacher who will tell you contradicting things and say they are the same. Beware of the last and most hateful, spiteful teacher that you will encounter. Beware of the false teacher within. Perhaps the greatest deception comes not from without, but from within. From our own thoughts. I invite you to hold me accountable for what I'm about to say. But I didn't learn this from the Bible. I learned this from a friend who said this, this to me uh, of a big blind spot that I had, that you probably have, that we all continue to have. He invited me, Eliza, and he didn't come up with this saying, don't believe everything you think. And so I invite you this morning, friend, don't believe everything you think. Hold every thought into captivity. We often ignore the biggest blind spot of them all, a personal confirmation bias. We're quick to measure up a preacher or a teacher or someone on the internet if they say something we don't trust or we don't like. Oh yeah, if they say something we don't like or well, that doesn't sound right, right away we start looking. We're like, all right, do they, are they one of these false teachers Pastor Eli was telling us about? Yes. 
but we have a hard time making sense of it if we default to looking for the red flags. If we are always <clears throat> waiting for our own minds to be the determining factor as to whether or not someone is a false teacher. When we're waiting, does it make sense to me before we actually check? We've already lost. The false teachers you should avoid won't always be teaching things you disagree with. Listen to me carefully. The false teachers that you should be avoiding will not always tell you things you disagree with. In fact, most of the time, my friend, oh, most of the time, they will be saying things you do agree with, things you like, things that you've already signed up for. Where would the danger in that be? The danger is that they will teach things you already accept, things you already believe to be true, things you already think make sense, things that you have already assumed. If they're not pointing you back to scripture, friend, if you are not able to point yourself back to scripture on the things you think are true and self-evident, you are that false teacher. One last passage. Does that make sense? We can be false teachers to ourselves when we don't hold our own ideas captive, when we don't hold our own ideas accountable to what the Bible says. Oh, it's, it's not enough that you are convinced that this is the right, that, that that is wrong, that that is sin, that this is right, that, that we should believe this way, that we should keep those festivals. If you've already subscribed to a specific idea without having consulted the Bible, friend, you are on a dangerous path. You will be the blind leading the blind. You will be motivated by pride to defend yourself. At the seminary, <clears throat> oh, bless the Lord, the seminary. The students had this phobia of the professor telling them they were wrong to the point that professors had to be specifically trained. And it's professors, you would, you, it, once you knew you were looking for it, you would find it every time. The professors were very intentional of not telling you you were wrong. You could see the most blatant, harebrained thing, and the professor would bend over backwards to try and, and be gentle and kind because it happened. A professor tells the story that when he started teaching at the seminary, he had asked a question, a very basic biblical question, and the student had answered wrong. And he said, no, actually, that's wrong. The correct answer is, and this student broke down and had a fit. This is a pastoral candidate. This is a seminarian at the Seventh-day Adventist Institution. Seventh-day Adventist Seminary Theological Seminary. How can you say that about me and say that I'm wrong and say that I'm worthless? We tie so much of our personal <coughs> self into the arguments that we make and believe. We tie too much of our personal stake in the beliefs that aren't even rooted in the Bible sometimes. We take it as a personal attack when somebody shows us, why do you think it's so difficult for people to become Adventists? There is so much that we show people, so much about the health message, so much about the state of the dead, beliefs that people don't just believe intellectually, they believe in their heart because it's a part of their identity. It's a part of the story they believe about their grandma. We're, we're literally attacking who they are because they've made those beliefs a part of who they are. Friend, don't make any belief, don't make any thought a part of who you are unless you see it in scripture. Flatly and plainly, friend, beware of yourself. 2 Corinthians 10, two through four, I promised you the last verse. Paul begs with the Corinthians. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness Speak loud with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. We don't fight according to what our bodies want. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Oh no, friend, the weapons of our warfare are not according to this flesh, not according to this mind, not according to my reasoning or any human philosopher, not according to Jordan Peterson, not according to Bernie Sanders, not according to anyone that you may admire in the world. Our only hope and argument should come from the word of God. Because our weapons of warfare are not of this flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds. Pause. What does stronghold mean? It's a perfect time to think and try and put everything we've learned into practice here. What does stronghold mean? What is a stronghold? What should we do? A stronghold can only be defined as we see it in the Bible. Oftentimes we ourselves, and I apologize for baiting you in, 
We will think, ah, I think I know what that means. No, friend. If you're trying to define what the author is saying, keep reading. What does stronghold mean? This is an exercise to determine our first reaction to a new term or a sentence or something that seems... The word stronghold in the Bible is very unique. It's so unique, in fact, that the Greek word for it only appears one time in the entire Old New Testament. It does, however, get translated in the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, in places where Joseph was thrown into prison, that same word is used there, stronghold. However, the way that Paul is using it here isn't according to an ideology that we may have isn't according to how we think about spiritual warfare. It's based on what he says in the very next sentence. But we have divine power to destroy strongholds. Verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God. And here it is. The one verse I hope that you will remember. The one line. We take every thought. Oh, friends, we take every thought into captivity to obey Christ. Test all things against Jesus. Even the stuff you agree with, even the stuff you are so, my laptop and the recording stops if I do that. Take what you think you know about the Sabbath. Take what you think you know about the health message. What you think you know about basic Christianity and measure it. Am I really in line with scripture? Because chances are there are points that I am missing on. There are points that I am blind about. There are things that I'm just not on the right track. Take every thought into captivity. Don't believe everything you think. Always, always default back to what the Bible says. This last invitation is for you, friend, who is young, who doesn't have an allegiance to a tradition of beliefs that the Adventist church has always had, that traditional Christianity has always had. You will be at a crossroads soon. A crossroads where you will have friends who believe one way, a society that pushes you another, you will see evidence on both sides, good evidence, responsible evidence. The Bible will be split in two for you. You will see the Bible teach you things that seem contradictory to what you've always grown up hearing from your parents, from your elders, from your church family. Friend, you are not loyal to this church. Friend, our teachings are not loyal to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our teachings are loyal to the Bible. And if present truth guides us somewhere new where you didn't think we could go, then you will be our pioneer. Friend, let me speak plainly. The issues that Adventism thinks are resolved right now require you to come back to Scripture. Obey what you find in Scripture. Don't obey what I tell you. Don't obey what your head elder, I love you, Steve, what anybody in our church tells you. Obey what you see God telling you in the Word. Always come back to Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, I invite you to sing this anthem with me. Number 272. Stand with me as we sing. Make this commitment. Don't sing for the person next to you. Sing for you. Sing it as a commitment that you will make. Give me, give me the Bible. Let's sing. Number 272.